Mike, thanks for joining me today. You are chairman of Department of Genetics at Stanford University School of Medicine and director of Center for Genomics of uh, Personal Medicine, as well as founder of several startup companies. On the top of that, you are also known as the entrepreneur who is working on a continuous monitoring information around our bodies through different devices. So tell me how many devices you're wearing today. Uh, probably about seven. Um, my four smartwatch is right here. Mm -hmm. I have some brand new hearing aids, uh, believe it or not, that are sensors as well. They measure my steps and can tell if I fall, I suppose. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, and they're on their way to tracking other things. So uh, yeah, and, and many other devices as well. So right. I mean, I want to just make sure I want to start with the proper background for you anyhow. Uh, I want to start with, um, first of all, your chair of the Department of Genetics at Stanford Medicine and also head of Snyder Lab. And Snyder Lab was the first to perform a large-scale functional genomics project in organism and has developed many technologies in genomics and proteomics. And you've been really studying the data, data of, and about our health. And I am really interested in the journey that you are going through. In particular, I think you're known as the man who wear all these devices and continuously monitoring yourself. Yeah, well, sure. So, um, I mean, I guess from my perspective, the way we got into using big data was to try and better understand both biological problems and then later health. And I like to think about it as a jigsaw puzzle. You know, if you're trying to study a biological problem or, or your health, you know, you don't just look at 10 pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. You want to see as many pieces as possible. And if it's a 1500 piece puzzle, well, try and see all 1500 if you can, the best understand exactly what's in that puzzle. And so that's really, I guess, the motivation behind what we do. We started by analyzing some biological problems with as much data as possible. And then more recently, we've turned this to human health. I just think the healthcare system's broken. We see, we look at people, you know, very infrequently. We, we look at, take so few measurements. We're really just getting 10 pieces of a 1500 piece, piece puzzle. So I really think uh, we should be getting a much deeper dive on people and profile them while they're healthy. So that's really what's drawn us in here. Try and use as much of these new big data technologies to better get a view of your health follow how it changes over time and try and catch disease at its earliest time. That's really the motivation behind all this. So I, I remember when I was at Samsung, I led one of the project called uh, Voice of the Body. And the idea was really trying to listen to your body and figure out how to change from reactive to proactive uh, system. And I think that's exactly what you're working on. The more I listen to you and what I, the more I read about, uh, the work that you're doing with your projects. So I'd like to know your perspective about where are we in this journey? Are we in the first inning of baseball analogy or are we making good progress? And how much do we know about our body? There's so much data that are coming out, which is great, but also it's very confusing because we've got different data about different conclusions you hear from genome data, from epigenetic data, and, and earlier lifestyle information. So I would love to get your perspective on we are, where we are on this journey. Sure. Well, I would say we're at the first inning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think medicine is broken. I think we it's really focused on sick care these days, treating people when they're ill. And I think we've got to shift it over to healthcare, where we're following people while they're healthy, take lots of measurements and catch illness at its earliest time. So I think, as you alluded to, when you're at Samsung and, and uh, what we do here is we profile people deeply while they're healthy and not just with a few measurements, but as part of a research lab, many, many measurements. And I'm sure we'll talk about it, but in, in some of the companies I've founded will study, you know, they'll, they'll do this as well in, in very specific areas, much more actionable information. So, so the lab is doing this from a research standpoint. We'll profile people as deeply as possible uh, ma making as, measure, ma as many measurements out of people's blood as possible, follow their what's called RNA and DNA and, or sorry, RNA and proteins and, and metabolites and lipids. We also follow their microbiome. And then with the wearables, we'll make all kinds of physiological measurements and, and we'll follow them over time. And so um, 
I think we're at the beginning in, in part because we're only just learning how to do this with the new advanced technologies that are out there, genome sequencing and interpreting people's genomes and then making all these measurements. And we're also in part only there because um, the system isn't quite set up for it. That is to say, you're, we, we don't have a reimbursement system that pays to keep you healthy. We have a, a reimbursement system that treats you when you're ill. And so we've got to ultimately shift that. So uh, I think we're at the beginning of, of trying to get people to understand and adopt this uh, concept of being able to profile people with you when you're healthy. And, and for certain areas, it's just got to save money for preventing cardiovascular disease, things like that, be, being able to profile people and keep them healthy. And, you know, if you think about it, we're in a, a, an obesity and, and diabetes endemic. It's actually probably worse than COVID. Uh, when you think about it, because the number of people that are diabetic, it's 9% now, 33% pre-diabetic, and those numbers are skyrocketing. And if we don't do something about it, you're going to have a, you, you're already going to head this way, a huge fraction of our population who are very unhealthy. And so we've got to be able to keep them healthy, follow them while they're healthy, and yeah, to do just that. You know, uh, recent, I think about two years ago, uh, when we could get together, I was speaker at the Stanford um, uh, Forum, Cardiovascular, uh, Cardio, uh, Cardiology Forum, I guess, uh, Dr. Joseph Wu is sponsoring. And I talked about, uh, what I learned from that was really that what you're just describing, America is number one leading country with obesity at over 33%, which means one out of three Americans are obese. And uh, most English-speaking countries are 20 cents above, including UK and Australia. And then you learn Germans. And then following to uh, it, it, the Mediterranean countries are teens, right? And then I learned the Korea, where I came from, in Japan, they're the lowest, 3 or 4 percent. So I wonder well, how they're much... heading up, though. They are heading in the wrong yeah, direction. So, thanks to know. a modern diet. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, that's the problem. We're in this world with a, a very carb-rich diet, and that's driving people to very unhealthy lifestyles and situations. So I think we've got to correct that. Yeah. So it's a very interesting on that area. I know you're also known for someone that are, I think you do a constant monitoring of glucose and That's trying to correct. understand the glucose interacting with your body. Can you uh, tell us about why you did it and what you learned from it? Yeah, well, it's part of this deep data measurement we do on people. So from the lab, what we did was we started by measuring, uh, putting these continuous glucose monitors, they're called. So they'll follow your glucose levels. And they had been used for type 1 diabetic and insulin-dependent type 2 diabetics before. But we started putting them on normal people and pre-diabetics and a few diabetics as well, what we discovered is that people are spiking their glucose out of control. And by the way, I'm, I'm type two diabetic. My genome predicted it actually, a tool Butte's lab predicted that I was a high risk for type two diabetes. And sure enough, I became type two diabetic, uh, but back on the glucose monitoring. So what we found is that as we put these on normal people and people are thought to be pre-diabetic, they were a lot, a lot of folks were spiking really, really badly after meals. And it turns out it's very food dependent and it probably depends in part on their microbiome. And by the way, some of these folks are spiking just as bad as diabetics, meaning their, the, their glucose dysregulation is just as bad as those who have diabetes and yet they were normal by other measurements. It probably has to do with how their glucose dysregulation is measured. But these devices we realize then are very, very powerful for telling whether you have glucose dysregulation and the odds are you're on the way to becoming diabetic. And so we, we discovered that in the lab. We published that a number of years ago. And, and I realized we need to get this out to the world. And so we formed a company, January AI, that is, in fact, doing just that. They, they actually will get glucose monitors on you so you can see how your glucose is doing. And they have a, um, you know, a great food recommender and, and uh, a great glycemic index uh, database of food so they can actually recommend foods you know if you like this and it spikes you keep away from that and eat this other food as well so i do think that's where we're going with all this in the long run that by having more information and knowing what certain lifestyle things like food and exercise do to you can better manage your health and and nowhere is it better than in, in glucose control because 
you control what food you eat, you control what activity you have. And, and this is one of the things that January AI is doing. They're, they're actually not just showing you and making food recommendations, showing you what your, your food does to you, but they, they'll show you, they'll teach you a little bit with their product, it's called Season of Me, how to, how to better mitigate your, your glucose spikes. So for example, it sounds obvious, but after you eat something that will spike you a lot, do a brisk 15 minute walk and you can really suppress that glucose spike. It's a big deal. So there's, there's things like that that are very, very powerful uh, out there. And I think these new technologies can really revolutionize the way in which we you know, manage people's health. And that's, how, that's why we're embracing them so much. So I think what you're saying is that uh, we all have different degree of tolerance for different food based on our biome, I think, and we don't have a consistent uh, reaction to food. So we all have to better understand about what we are eating and what the reaction to that. And, and the tools like const constant monitoring glucose could be very useful because then you learn about what makes more sense and there's a recommendation engine that can help you to uh, watch out for those kind of food that can give you spikes. Is that the right uh -huh. conclusion? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and thank you for summarizing that. <clears throat> so as an example, some people spike to bananas, others to bread, others to pasta. So we all spike to different things. Mm. And it's very personal. And your and your microbiome, the gut in your the bacteria in your gut are, are partly responsible. It's not the whole explanation, but it's part of it. And so by by empirically wearing these devices, you can see exactly which which foods spike you. So, uh, and, and it turns out now I'm a pretty bad diabetic. Most foods spike me, but uh, for some people, like I say, it'll just be possible we'll, we'll spike them and other people it's, it's fruits. And so again, you can learn this by wearing these monitors and then adjust your, your lifestyle appropriately so that you can get better glucose control. And we think that's a pretty important thing. And so, um, and it's totally personalized. Mm. So what I'm learning from you is that we are all different. I start with the genome, I guess, give you certain yeah. bias. And then what we eat matters. And then, and, then, and then figure out, make sure we take a walk after we eat because they can bring <laughs> your liver down. I think there are three things I learned. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and again, we can even teach you what foods to better eat, at least mm -hmm. through January AI. It, it's, it's, and yeah, if this one spikes you, uh, try this, which shouldn't spike you based on its glycemic load and, and the composition of food. So again, I think this, we can all have better personalized diets and better personalized lifestyle. And even for how activity affects you, I think it affects people a little bit differently and also timing of when you eat and this sort of thing. These are all going to affect uh, exactly what happens to you uh, mm -hmm. in terms of your glucose regulation. So very interesting. Now let's talk about AI because whenever we talk about big data, especially human body has so much different data. Uh, how do you use AI to make sense or what is the role of AI and how do you see that uh, implying in this journey? Yeah, it's going to ultimately be a big deal in many different levels. So for example, we're actually using AI to interpret genomes, believe it or not. Uh, we can use information out there to try and make predictions of your genetic risk. For example, COVID severity is a good case. We can predict COVID severity based on some uh, AI algorithms we've been using to try and figure out which genes are associated with COVID risk. And this is now being done. We're doing it for AL ALS and other diseases as well. So that's one example. Other examples would be um, people trying to make decisions about which drugs people might best respond to based on information about them. Uh, that one doesn't have to be very sophisticated, but you can actually make predictions, you know, knowing how you respond or what features are associated with um, you, you can try and better predict what drugs might work for, for, for example, even for diabetes. And this is still early days, it's not all worked out. But I think where this is going, it's gonna all happen at a personal level. And this is something we're building. So for example, uh, we're working with chronic fatigue in other areas where we're trying to actually see chronic fatigue syndrome. We're trying to see basically um, what people's personal patterns are, what kinds of activities are associated with 
they're called crash days, days that aren't so good, uh, versus days where they're doing just fine. And if we can make predictions, we gather lots of data about what they're eating, what their activities are, what's going on. And then we try and associate which days, you know, which activities might be bad for them and which ones might be good for them and then set up personalized models. And I think that's gonna be different for different people. So different thresholds will cause people to crash if you exercise too much, for example, and you have chronic fatigue syndrome. So, so and I think we can do this for everything, for your health. And, and we're, we're doing a lot in this space for COVID-19. And I'm happy to tell you more about that if you like. Oh, fascinating. You know, it's just, uh, I think you are really innovating and improving health journey by gathering data and trying to make a sense out of it today with the computational capability and the amount of data that's available, I think it is much more possible than ever before. My, uh, my son actually studied biome as a part of his, uh, his study, and he told me that we only know about 20% of what, we, what, what is in our guts. So what does it tell you about our journey here? Well, you, like you say, we're still at the first inning. We have a lot to learn still, mm -hmm. but we are learning a lot more. And as we get more data and more people, we'll better understand which microbes are associated with good things like uh, immune stimulators and things like that, which ones are associated with bad mm -hmm. uh, features. And we want to obviously maximize the good and avoid the bad. And, uh, you know, it is complicated because it's all an interplay. For example, the food you eat, the fiber you eat, it specifically affects your microbes in your gut, which in turn affects your, both your immune system and your metabolism. So they're all interconnected and your genome will have a play in this as well. And so we need to understand this complicated relationship because it will vary from one person to the next. You may not realize it, but you have more immune cells in your gut than anywhere else in your body. And that's because it's playing with your uh, your microbiome, if you will, and that will be very personalized. And so uh, you can see then how the food, which feeds your microbiome, which in turn affects your immune system and your metabolism, they're all interrelated and, and they're all very, very personal. Mm. It's so exciting. There's so much uh, learning to go on. And I'm sure every day you're learning the new discovery and learning about the new trend. And I think even glucose, continuous glucose monitoring, uh, Dexcan devices or other LibreAv devices, these things are expensive and painful, right? So are there some innovations? Well, not that, that painful, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, and they're not that expensive. Um, I'm not sure, they're somewhere between 70 and $100. Uh, so, but it's yeah, but for 10 days, that's really expensive. You know, if yeah, you want to well, wait it every 10 days. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. If you use them a lot, it'll add up a lot. But to do yeah. it once isn't so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and and yeah, so but I would argue it's worth it for your health to know what's spiking you, uh, because you'll quickly adopt habits. It's very eye opening, by the way, when you when you eat these things. Sometimes it's very very obvious in hindsight. I was talking to a reporter once who said, "Mike, I was eating the most healthy." meals possible. I was, I was surprised when I wore one of these continuous glucose monitors that it was spiking through the roof. He was eating salmon on salad. He said, what could be healthier than that? And then, of mm. course, he discovered it was actually the balsam salt, the sauce that he put on top that had sugar in it <laughs> that spiked him through the roof. So by seeing this, he realized what was going on. So he simply left off the sauce. And now he is truly eating a healthy lunch <laughs> it's amazing yeah how yeah. some things that you don't think about has other things that are unintended consequences in the food it yeah. really matters a lot oh uh, yeah. tell me a little bit about COVID-19 because I think you are uh alluding to that you can actually predict the severity of a uh, reaction to uh, COVID-19 based on 13 gene markers uh, or is it based on 13 the monitoring devices that can give you uh, <laughs> uh, predictions. I'd like to understand those two dimensions. Yeah, sure. Well, we're doing two angles there. One is the genetics, as you alluded to, where right. we've used new machine learning methods to, to, to analyze risk for COVID-19 severity. So obviously, when you're very old, you're at high risk or you have immune problems. But it turns out a lot of young folks actually get severe COVID and, and that's really perplexing. And it turns out there's a strong genetic component to that. We've actually using machine learning 
believe it or not, found over 1,300 genes that actually contribute to this COVID severity. And it turns out using genetics, we can tell exactly what's going on. It's, it's natural killer and T cells are the primary ones that are responsible for this um, using the genetic analysis. And so we're trying to set up a predictive score based on your genome sequence. Can we predict whether you're at risk for COVID severity? So that's one angle. The other angle is one you also alluded to, which is using wearables. So we had discovered a number of years ago that actually is from my Lyme disease of all things. I first figured out when I got Lyme disease because my heart rate went up and my blood oxygen went down. I was wearing a smartwatch at the time. I was measuring my heart rate and skin temperature. And, and we later learned my skin temperature also went off as well. So I actually was the first alerted to this before symptoms, by the way, before symptoms, mm. I could see that something was wrong because my heart rate shot up and my blood oxygen dropped. And as I say, I later learned skin temperature. So we went back and, and looked and, and I went to a doctor later when I got a fever just after that. And I warned him it might be Lyme. He, he actually said, well, uh, he, he measured my, my immune cells, said, yeah, you've got a bacterial infection. You know, you're, you're, you should take penicillin. And I said, no, I should take doxycycline, which is what you mm. for Lyme. So it was a little tense, but he did give in and it, I took it, I cleared it up. And then I got tested. Sure enough, I was Lyme positive and wow. I'd given blood even before this. It so happens I was negative. So I was here converted during that time. Yeah. The point out of, the, yeah. The point out of all this, I could take Lyme pre-symptomatically with a smartwatch and a pulse ox. Mm -hmm. So we then looked at all the data. I had two years of data as ill four times. Once was the Lyme time, twice were viral infections. And the fourth was a time I was probably ill, but asymptomatic because I had high what's called C-reactive protein. Very, it's, it goes up when you're sick. And mm -hmm. all four times I was ill, I could actually see my heart rate jumped up. So we wrote, and my skin temperature turns out too. So we wrote an algorithm that lets you tell when you're getting ill, even before you realize it from your smartwatch resting heart rate information. And it turns out it worked pretty well. Me, there's all mm -hmm. retrospective, worked on uh, other people who were in our study. Every single time before they got ill, they had a jump up and resting heart rate. It didn't work as well for skin temperature because I don't think people were wearing the watch tight enough and it worked for some people, but not others. So for the COVID case, then as you might imagine, so we published this uh, about five years ago, 2017. And so we were improving the algorithms and we were building an infrastructure. This is a big deal. We're building an infrastructure to try and scale this thing. And along comes COVID, of course, in March, 2020, at least in the US. And so we very, very quickly, uh, and basically relaunched the study. We had one running, but we were launched it around COVID and quickly enrolled people who are 5,300 5, people, 5,300 people who had, uh, uh, who were wearing smartwatches and 32 of them actually had had COVID already. And they were wearing the smartwatch. They had a diagnosis date and a symptom date. And what we discovered is that in 80% of the cases, we could tell when people would have a jump up in their resting heart rate in advance of symptom formation, or either yeah. at or in advance, and 80% of the time. And the median was four days, and some people had as much as 10 days ahead. You couldn't miss a very clear signal of a jump up at resting heart rate. So we went on to actually analyze that further, and then ultimately we, we got it working pretty well. So we set up a real-time detection system that alerts you when you have a jump up in resting heart rate. And it is a, basically it's a measure of stressors. And it turns out it also works about, it's a real time detection system. You can download the app right now, innovations.stanford.edu slash wearables. Love mm -hmm. to have as many people sign up. So again, innovations.stanford.edu slash wearables. Come join our study if you're wearing a smartwatch. And the algorithm we have now works for both resting, uh, uh, sorry, works on resting heart rate mostly. It does bring in sleep, as you say, I wanna bring in other data types, but it follows people in real time. And if they have a jump up in, in this resting heart rate algorithm uh, detected by the algorithm, they will basically get a red alert. So you mm. can see if, if you know, a red alert goes off, it's a sign that a stressor event is happening. Doesn't guarantee it's COVID, in fact, most of the time it's probably not COVID because you have other stressors, but mm -hmm. uh, it does work for COVID. Again, 80% of the time, it even works asymptomatic cases, 14 out of 18 mm -hmm. asymptomatic cases. 
we could pick up with this resting with this resting heart rate from a smartwatch. And so we think this is a very, very powerful detection system because if you think about what's going on now, they measure you by temperature, which doesn't really work that well for COVID. I don't know about you, but if you walk up to a restaurant, it'll shine the infrared temperature gauge on you. Uh, mine reads 33 degrees centigrade, which of course is ridiculous. Uh, and they let me in anyway, because mm. you know it's not out of range, but it's because it's cold outside, that's why it's cold. So, so we think temperature is not a very good way to measure COVID-19, it's a way, but it's not the best way. And then there's PCR and that's too slow. Even the antigen test, you don't do it every day. But these rest, these, these um, smartwatches are measuring you 24 seven. That's what makes them so powerful. They're measuring mm -hmm. 24 seven, 365 days a year. We can see when you have a jump up and resting heart rate over your baseline and it'll send this alert. And as I say, it works for COVID. It works for uh, other illnesses as well. And it does go off at other times, meaning if you, drink way too much, uh, you will have a high heart rate the next day and it'll go off of that. So you may have to contextualize it. Sometimes travel does it. Uh, people who do super stress events like run a marathon, your heart rate will be up for several days thereafter. It'll set it off. So you do have to contextualize the information. But if you're just sitting around and, and you get one of these red alerts, it means something is up. And so we think this is going to be the future. Ultimately, we will be just like your car has a dashboard that's measuring the car's health. We're going to have the, these devices, your aura ring, my watches. They're going to be able to tell when something's off. And you only need one watch, by the way. We, I use a lot just to test them out and see what resolution is best and what kinds of information I can draw from them to better be able to detect this. I honestly think if we can get more information in, I'll be able to better tell the difference between, you know, an alcohol and a, and a marathon run from a COVID-19 infection. We just need more data for that. You know, it's an interesting. I, I use probably two devices the, the most, uh, my Aura and the Garmin. And yep. the Garmin as a way to, mainly because they have a pretty good heart rate also monitoring. And I, I run and I cycle. And I also swim, so these things are all very useful indication. And I think you're right, this longitudinal, right? That over time, being able to see yourself and being able to see the trend line. And then when something is up, we give you early warning system, which I think is what you're referring to, red alert. And yeah. I think what you're doing at Stanford sounds really great because it's really good. Because there are a lot of tools that can help us to know before you even react to, before you even realize your body is sick. That's right. So you're 100% you're spot on. You have to know your healthy baseline so you can see the shift up when something goes off. And it turns out everybody's healthy baseline is different. So we all have different resting heart rates. We have different blood oxygen levels. We have different respiration rates, et cetera. And so by knowing what your healthy baseline is, it's very easy to detect when you're off from that, something goes up. And a good example is temperature I, I, I mentioned before. So it turns out that we're taught our average temperature when you put a thermometer in your mouth is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. I think it's 37 centigrade. And it turns out, first of all, that number is wrong. It's actually lower, it's 97.6. But more importantly, there's a spread. So the 25th quartile is 94.6, four degrees down what people claim the normal healthy baseline is. And the 75th quartile is 99.1. I personally am 97.3, and mine's shifted a little bit over eight years. But the point out of all this in today's world, if your normal healthy baseline is 94.6, and you go to a physician's office and they measure you at 98.6, they'll tell you you're healthy, everything's great, you're fine. But you're really up four degrees Fahrenheit over your baseline, I guarantee you're not fine. Mm -hmm. And this is why we think it's really, really important to know your healthy baseline so you can detect those shifts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're all... I think what it shows is we are different and we have to all know the differences. And over time, we can see what the changes are happening with our body. I want to change a little bit about your entrepreneurship because you're clearly distinguished, uh, well-known researcher and lab leader, and yet you're also entrepreneur. So tell me about your entrepreneurship. Why did you do it? Is it because you want to extend and, and being able to do things we couldn't do in academics or just give me your interest in 
because our community is mostly uh, CEOs and entrepreneurs who want to learn about the mega trend and opportunities. Yeah, so you know, my my job at Stanford is to do uh, fun and creative science, and and that's what academics are good at. They're really good at discovering things, showing proof of principle, things like that. They're absolutely no good at scaling. So as we go along and do our research and we discover something like when we first sequenced my genome and saw what it took to actually interpret the genome, you know, how do we interpret a healthy person's genome for medical risk and things like that? Uh, we went through it. I got the process. I said, all right, this is good. This, and, but now this is what a company should do. My lab shouldn't be interpreting 30,000 genomes. This is what companies can do. So we founded a company. It's called Personalis and they've done very well. And this is there that within a year, they were way better at sequencing genomes and doing the analysis than my lab was because they're just so much more skilled at it. And the same is true for some other companies. Another company I formed after that's called QBio. This deep profiling we're doing that I was telling you about, they actually took a, they made a medical version of this and added a whole body MRI. And that gives a nice medically relevant picture, a deep data if you will, medical picture of your health and they follow you longitudinally. So it, it's, a, it's an applied spinoff of what we're doing. And, and the reason we do that is because my lab could do it as a research thing. It costs millions of dollars, but a company then can scale this. So they'll, they'll actually give you a medical profile for $3,500. It's not cheap, but it's, it's cheaper than my lab could do it. And they give you a whole body MRI on top of that. So uh, basically, it's exactly what you say. We, we spin off these companies. We don't really, as an academic group, we don't do it to form companies. But once we see something we think will be useful, will be very valuable, we will try to get it out to the world because we'd like to see everybody take advantage of that. And January AI, which I mentioned earlier, you know, mm -hmm. they're a continuous glucose monitoring company that's trying to improve people's metabolic health. It's based on, again, discoveries. And we have many, many examples of this. I have a watch company called Sensomics that mm -hmm. gives high, very high resolution data we think will be very, very powerful for certain kinds of applications. And, and so, again, this is these all spin off from our research. It's a way to scale it and get it out to the world. So, Mike, if you have a wish list of, you know, here's what I need that are sensors or biomarker information, they can really change and have a big impact on the world. What's your wish list that you'd like to see from uh, scientists? <laughs> well, yeah, there? one wish list would be put a wearable device, a smartwatch or a ring on every person on the planet. Mm -hmm. So you may realize that 3.8 billion people have a smartphone. And I think this is going to be your health monitor of the future, your smartphone. And so uh, in the future, I would love to see everyone have this paired with a smartwatch. And again, 3.8 billion people have a smartphone. So if you add a simple smartwatch or a ring with this, you have a health sensor for the majority of the planet. That's pretty wild, right? And we sh I think we should be doing these devices. They're not that expensive now. They're even going to get cheaper in the future. So we could really be taking care of people's health at scale. And then I'd like to see us go beyond that. The things that QBio, January AI, others are doing and, and also, ultimately, I'm a believer everybody will be getting their genome sequence before they're born, and we'll be able to figure out what their risks are, and then, you know, keep on the alert for things that might pop up relevant to that, uh, mm -hmm. so we can better keep people healthy. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And so, in this deep profiling we've been doing, we've been doing deep profiling on 109 people for now about nine years, believe it or not. And just from the first three and a half years, we half of them learned something pretty important about their health. One person we discovered early lymphoma, two people with serious heart issues, so on and so forth. So we really found a lot of pretty important health-related things. And QBio has done the same. They found, you know, some of the early pancreatic cancer, all these sorts of things. So these this big data can really, really be useful for, for seeing what your health picture looks like and then catching disease at its earliest and then treating people all before they're symptomatic when it's way too late. I thought you were gonna say, Young, what I need is non-invasive glucose sensors so that they are really cheap, really easy to use, that are integrated in my smartphone so that we all can be able to monitor 24 by seven. And then January, I can give us a really good nutrition recommendation engine based on your own body longitudinal data. Absolutely, I mean, I think that will be part of it. 
Whether they're how well non-invasive procedures versus minimally invasive ones work, I don't know yet. Right mm -hmm. now, we're in the world of minimally invasive ones. I, as I say, I don't think they're too, and they will get dirt cheap. I think they'll be, you know, a few cents in the future. Right now, they're more expensive because re people are recovering the research costs. But in the future, they should be fairly inexpensive. And I think that's a good one. So I, I would argue smart watches, continuous glucose monitors are just low hanging fruit. We should bring those on right now. But in the future, it's going to be all these data types, everything I've been talking about, including whole body MRI. Get ready for that. People right now, like the medical system does not want you to do a whole body MRI because they're worried you're going to find nodules. But mm. I say you want whole body MRI, not because, yes, everybody has nodules. We know that. The question is, do you have any growing nodules? And the only way you know that is to measure yourself longitudinally. And if you take several measurements, you will pretty quickly know if any of your nodules are growing and that's what you want to catch. And mm -hmm. I think that's a big deal. And that's a uh, cube bio. That is, that is actually what I'm also hearing as well, right? As a kind of new way of also monitoring changes, but the whole body MRI sounds really expensive. And wouldn't we also have a, um, I mean, that requires quite a bit of scanning over time to see the impact. Um, well, again, I think for the first group of people we've done, if I were to show you the list with early pot prostate cancer from the first, but then mm. 100 people, the pancreatic cancer, some with cardiovascular disease, some with fatty liver disease, uh, it was quite a few major findings. Now, it is an older cohort. People who are over 50 usually do, uh, do this. So the chances of finding something are higher. But uh, yeah, and it's expensive now, but it'll be cheap in the future. And I would argue $3,500, pretty cheap if it's keeping you healthy. If someone has a heart attack and goes on long-term disability, that's extremely expensive. That so is you, true. Yeah, yeah, you could argue. And so, so certain at-risk populations, absolute no-brainer to be mm. doing this stuff. But in the future, it'll be cheaper and everybody will be doing it, in yeah. my opinion. I think, Mike, I think your point is by using data, whether it's the scanning, monitoring your information, you know, trying to change the equation from reactive to proactive and, and in the predictive. In the process, we can actually reduce overall healthcare cost. And I think the other things you were referring to as a problem is it doesn't have incentive system to help to go there because reimbursement system is not quite there. And which is due to what I understand the American system of this provider, patient, and then in between the uh, uh, financing side is not quite connected into one. So it's a system that requires a bit more better aligned incentive system, I guess, between the ecosystem here. Yeah, that's 100% right. So the ultimate goal to reiterate is actually to keep people as healthy as long as long as possible and then they would die. <laughs> so they would be, you know, they would extend their health span and live long, healthy lives. That's the goal. But you're right, there's no incentive for that. That is a problem. So we need new incentive models, especially in the US. So the problem with the US is people change their providers every 18 months. So why should somebody spend $3,500 on you and 18 months later, you're gonna be with somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and so A, as the technology get cheaper, that incentive will, that, that problem will go away. But B, we do need new models because it is expensive for providers to have someone who go gets you know uh, has a stroke and has all this costs you know one day in the intensive care unit can easily be fifty thousand dollars it's very very expensive and so we can try to keep people out of that and I think the way to do this there's several ways to incentivize people I think there's for, quite frankly there's only two ways to incentivize people one is money and the other is family so if we can get people to be able to you know maybe they pay less on their insurance or their health plan if they run more active lives or eat better. And, and you can demonstrate that, you know, certainly these days you can with the activity monitors. Uh, we can also try and get corporations involved too to, you know, incentivize their workers to do these things because they'll have better productivity, which will, you know, both be good for the worker as well as the company if people are, are doing better. And the other way is to get families involved. And an example I like to use is when my mother-in-law got, you know, cancer, my wife, her daughter was the best person for, you know, telling her, did you take your pills that I keep her very 
motivated to, you know, do these things she should be doing. So I think we need to take advantage of all these ways and, and incentivize people to live better, healthier lives. Because even though we can point out, yes, you're high risk for type 2 diabetes, if you don't do anything about it, uh, we failed. So we need to have behavior modification is, is still a big issue here for, right. again, preventative health. Well, it just shows great opportunities are in front of us. And you are beginning, if you're really first inning of this journey, we have a lot of work to do. And it's very exciting that we can be able to learn about our body, learn about us, and then being able to make a better impact, which in turn as a society should save lives, should reduce the cost, and should reduce the burden because we will figure out pro, you know, changing the game from reactive to proactive uh, game, I guess. 100% agree, yeah. Let's keep everybody healthy and happy, I think, in the process. Well, I really appreciate your time and I enjoyed talking with you. And uh, I got some companies I want to introduce to you that are working on this glucose um, 24 by 7 glucose monitoring that are okay, sure. minimally invasive, but trying to reduce, trying to hit very low cost. All right, great. Love right. to meet them. And uh, yeah, there's tons of opportunity in this field, as you say, in, in all these different areas. We're spinning off a few others ourselves. So Great. Well, continue to have a great journey and thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me.